Okay, so um, we're a little bit late getting started here, but I wanted to thank everybody for joining us today for Ask the Expert. Um, my name is Ann McClure, and I'm a residential realtor with Mac and Ernie Associates. I work and am licensed um, and work by referral in close in Northern Virginia, Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, and all of Maryland I can work in, but I keep to suburban Maryland around the Beltway. And um, I've got partners who help me across the river in DC where I'm not licensed. And um, this is Ask the Expert. And every couple of weeks, we like to bring a local business and share some expertise with you on a given field or industry, something home or house related or real estate related actually. And um, we're so happy you've joined us. Ask the Expert used to be something that we did live and in person. We'd have a happy hour and we'd have, oh, five, six, seven experts roaming the room with their, you know, um, like kitchen designer or flooring or electrician. And we would invite our clients and they could come and ask their questions and have a couple of drinks. It was really fun. And then during the pandemic, uh, we, Jennifer, who works with me in the office, um, got the brilliant idea to keep doing it, but do it online and bring a different business every so often. So this week, I'm really happy to say we have Alex Ballinger with us from End Time Design. Thank you, Alex, for joining us. We're so happy to have you here. We're going to hear a little bit more from you a little later. So yeah, and thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. We're so glad you could come, and um, and I'm eager to talk with you. I can't believe how much I learn from these myself every time. So um, I I first like to start with a little bit of a market update, and then we will launch right into Alex's portion um, because. My expertise, of course, is real estate. And what we do is we record these so that this will be available to you later on YouTube. It'll be on my website. It'll be on Facebook. And we're going to send it to Alex, and he will have it also available on his website or however he wants to disseminate the information. So if you're looking for this later or you want to share it, and we hope you do with friends or family, somebody thinking of doing a kitchen or bathroom model or library or whatever, please send along the information. It's really good information. And... Um, if you misplace it, always feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to get the information to you again. So um, by way of a, qu a quick market update, um, for the week of May 1 through May 7, so the first week of May, contract activity throughout our metro region, so suburban Maryland, Northern Virginia, and of course the district was down 13.2% compared to the same week last year. All of the jurisdictions reported decreases and the reason for the decline, which of course many of you are hearing anywhere across the country this is happening, um, is the rise, <clears throat> excuse me, the rise in mortgage interest rates. So rates right now are a full two points, two percentage points higher than they were this time last year. And the impact on lower price ranges, which are more sensitive to that kind of a change, is really hard to miss. In fact, it's very interesting because properties priced over a million are not really being impacted. Contract activity was up in the million dollar plus price points by 24%, yet the overall market was down over 13%. So really shows you who's being impacted by the higher interest rates. And um, we're gonna keep an eye on things for you. It is still a seller's market. Um, there's still a lot less inventory in every category than there has been in recent recent past, you know, last couple of years. So. Um, still a seller's market, but it's, it is changing a bit and certainly in certain price points more than others. Um, the days on market, how long a property spends on the market before it goes under contract is still very tight. It's just over two weeks across the region. It's about 15 days, but there are parts of the region where it's nine or 10 days. So properties are still moving very quickly. And so the market is brisk and it's still a very good time to sell. Um, it's, it's a tough time to buy. Um, but there are opportunities out there, and increasingly so as we get into summer and, and some of the dynamics of the marketplace change. So if you have questions about your market, about something you're hoping to do in the future, I hope you'll reach out. We're always happy to answer whatever we can and get good information in your hands. And if you've got friends or family somewhere else in the country, I can always connect you with a good realtor there who can help. So without further delay, I want to get to Alex. Alex Ballinger is a field operations manager with End Time Design based out of Alexandria, Virginia, but he can help people all over the metro region, right, Alex? Yes, that's correct. D.C., Maryland, Virginia. And Alex has a fondness for kitchen design, largely thanks to his stint in the hospitality industry. So he left the hospitality industry in 2018 and got into the kitchen and bath cabinet design business 
um, in 2018. And I don't want to say it's limited to just kitchen and baths because he can do libraries. He can do home offices. He can do um, lower level bar areas. He can do closets. He actually yeah. did these built-ins behind me um, in my office. So yeah. um, Alex, we're a little late starting. We had some tech difficulty. So I'm hoping you'll sure. have a little time to go a little longer if we can, I apologize to those of you watching yeah, of live, but um, if we have question, time, a couple questions at the end, we will be happy to take them. You can just put them in the chat, um, but we're going to launch right in with Alex here. And Alex, thank you for being gracious about the timing. No problem at all. Thank so you Alex, again for having me. Oh, we're so happy to have you. I'm really pleased <laughs> you could do this. Um, Alex, as you know, I recently did a very large renovation project at my house. And yeah. while I did not do a kitchen redo, which was really the only thing I didn't redo, um, I worked with you on custom cabinetry. And uh, we did some um, bathroom uh, cabinets, custom cabinets, and built-ins for my office. Um, and I feel like every time I think I know a lot about um, an industry that's sort of related to house or home, and I'm like, oh, what else is there to learn? There's so much more to learn. It's I'm mm -hmm. humbled by how much I don't know every time I talk with an expert. So um, I first wanted to share something really interesting that I found on the National Associ Association of Realtors website related to return on investment. Because I get this question a lot, which is, you know, how much if I put into a kitchen or a bathroom or whatever given project um, can I expect to get back? And I always tell people, you know, do these projects because you like doing them and it's going to help you love your home and how you live in your home better. Um, but you can expect some return on investment. And um, with that stated, uh, we sometimes look at um, what somebody might be able to do in terms of where they put their money in their house by the, um, by the room or maybe by the feature. So it could be like hardwood floors or it could be the kitchen. And um, we found a statistic from the National Association of Realtors that showed that the return on investment right now, this was a 2022 study, and I think we've got a slide, hopefully we've got one, um, but the return on investment for kitchens is about 75%. So think of it this way, 75 cents on the dollar is about what you get back for um, a kitchen remodel. And I think the slide is coming here, so yes, if you take a look where the uh, blue arrow is on the left, complete kitchen renovation, 75%. Um, and then there's a kitchen upgrade, 67%. So that, that gives you a sense. And actually right above that is closet renovation, which of course, Alex, you can do also um, mm -hmm. 83%. And even basement conversion to living area, that could be making a kitchenette area. Uh, yeah. That could be an in-law or a repair suite. Huh? Basement bar. Exactly. So Man cave, these, yeah. Yeah, I thought these numbers would be great to share um, just so people can kind of have a sense of what they might get out of their the money that they spend on a kitchen or bathroom or basement or whatever it is. So um, so I wanted to share that, but I'm going to launch into the questions now with you. And I wanted to ask, Alex, where do you recommend that people start the process? So like if they're thinking of taking on a kitchen or bathroom remodel, um, which could include some of the other things we just talked about that you can do, where should they start? So, you know, the, we touched on this um, previously too, and I think you're going to want to, first of all, get together, uh, get together an idea of why you're doing a remodel. So most of the times with our clients, uh, they fall into one of two categories. The first being they want to remodel a kitchen or any space in their home to sell or turn into a rental. So in that case, um, you know, you're, you're just making the space a little more nicer, making it more functional to either put on the market or uh, get renters in there. The other client is going to fall into the category of doing the remodel for themselves. So making their own home or space in their home more livable and functional and more aesthetically pleasing. So decide what you're doing the remodel for, whether it's for yourself or um, to sell or rent the property. 
And then, you know, prioritize your wants and needs in this space. So is it to make the storage more functional for you? Maybe you want to take out a pantry closet and make more functional, um, you know, pantry cabinetry with rollout trays and stuff as an example. So prioritize the storage needs. And then I might be a little biased in saying this, but I think the first person you should get in touch with is a kitchen designer. Because a kitchen designer is going to know people in all the different trades and they're going to know the different um, experts, you know, that you need to bring in and advise you on your remodel. So normally who's going to be involved is me, a kitchen designer, a general contractor, and then maybe an architect interior designer. So I'll be responsible for putting together your cabinet plan. The contractor is going to be responsible for the installation. An architect, depending on how extensive the remodel is, is going to help you, um, you know, put together that plan. And then an interior designer is going to help you um, pick the materials. So get the right people in place, you know, decide what you're doing the remodel for, and then budget comes after that. Okay, so if I heard you correctly, it's sort of assembling, first you want your purpose, which if you're doing it for resale, you're probably not going to need all these other roles, right? But if mm -hmm. you're doing it for yourself and it's more detailed, it's bigger in scale, you're probably going to need at least a couple of um, other experts. And right. um, you're probably going to have a bigger budget just as a rule of thumb. Because as your realtor, I would say, do not spend a ton of money on a house you're selling, which is yeah. why I always like to see people do it you know, three, five, seven years before they sell so they can enjoy it. And usually they pick really nice features and appointments when mm -hmm. they're enjoying it themselves. You know, I think the end product is better. And then they get to, they get to, you know, the money they spend, they get to enjoy some of it as well. Exactly. You know, like someone doing a remodel to sell is going to be more budget conscious, whereas mm -hmm. someone who's remodeling a space for themselves is going to be maybe, you know, way more what they want the space to look like. And they're willing to spend that extra money on, you know, better cabinetry or other materials. You have a, a notation here, which I think is critical, which is helpful tips, get recommendations. You know, th these are references or referrals. I mean, I, I'm a realtor whose business model is working by referral. So I totally believe in this. And you can ask for detailed questions about, you know, let, let's face it, a big deal right now is supply chain delays. You know, how did this vendor work with you on supply chain delays and were you kept posted, you know? So these mm -hmm. kinds of things are really important. You don't go in blindly. Yeah. I mean, I should have said that first. You said, where do you start? So where you should actually probably start is by asking around, mm -hmm. asking neighbors on LiftServ or, um, uh, you know, asking around on the neighborhood blogs, getting in touch with neighbors and friends and relatives who have done kitchen remodels in the area. So you could even see the work that maybe their contractor or kitchen designer um, did for them and ask them how their experience was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think your other point here of um, asking one professional who's another professional you like I think that makes a lot of sense. I had to do that recently for a brick mason because I thought, well, this person sees that kind of work and they're going to, you know, who are they referring? Another right. one was a, an engineer recently looking at sort of a complicated water intrusion project. And and I, he mentioned he had to do something at his home. I said, well, who was your contractor? You know, because I mm -hmm. figured if a picky engineer was happy, it must be a good contractor. So yeah, I thought those, those were great tips. Um, so sort of related to this, you know, you, you're asking around, you're getting uh, referrals to good professionals, you're thinking about the roles of the people you want involved, and then there's the budget, right? So um, that's, that's a huge piece and maybe the one that people bring up the most often, um, yeah. and we certainly touched on it with the National Association of Realtors data there. Um, but how do you recommend somebody budgets for one of these projects? And um, And I want to ask people to bear in mind that Costs are not static. You know, I just did a big remodel and I had a budget and then COVID came in the supply chain and I had to really restructure how I was able to pay for what I wanted to do because I had approved a plan. And then to do that plan, the cost changed. Right. Yeah. So when you're putting together your budget, I mean, first of all, kind of just come up now, the National Kitchen and Bath Association, right, will say that 
you should spend about 10% of your home's value on a kitchen remodel. So you have a $500,000 home, you're putting about $50,000 into a kitchen remodel. I would say rarely do our clients end up spending that much. That's kind of, you know, the NKBA guidelines or standards. But just to give you kind of a frame of reference, 10% of your home's value. Um, so kind of start with an overall number and go down from there. You're going to have materials, which are mostly going to be... Um, cabinets, counters, appliances, and a kitchen, and then other finishing materials such as paint, tile, flooring, light fixtures. Now, cabinets, counters, and appliances are usually going to be about a third of your budget. And then the other two thirds is going to be finishing materials and labor. Finishing so, materials to include what kinds of things? Tile? Tile, light flooring, okay. paint color, light fixtures, uh, cabinet hardware, that's a minor one that people usually forget, plumbing fixtures. So, you know, a lot of plumbing fixtures are becoming a huge trend these days with pop fillers and water filters and prep sinks and um, different plumbing fixtures that you might want in a space. So, you know, the, the, the actual installed materials, which are going to be your cabinets, counters and appliances, which are stationary, those kind of aren't going anywhere. That's one third. And then the finishing materials are kind of the, the like I just mentioned, the, the things that get added in at the end, kind of punch list items. And labor, that two thirds was and labor. labor. So, uh, okay, I'm going to use your example. $500,000 home, 10%. I know most of your clients don't really spend 10, but for our example. And by the way, if you're spending 10%, you better be using your kitchen. This is not for a flip because you're not going to make yeah. any money. Exactly. Um, not to sell it. I mean, not to turn around and sell it. But but um, using your example, fifty thousand. That means approximately seventeen five is cabinet, counter, and appliance. Yeah. Okay. This is that's a what you should aim thumb. for. That's what you should shoot for. Great rule of thumb. Thank you for that. That's really really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Shifting gears a little from the the practical monetary side. Can you share with us some of the latest design trends in cabinetry and countertops? I always think this is fun. Yeah, so right now, colors. So we'll touch on color trends first. I mean, uh, the what used to be the honey oak and kind of oak cabinetry of the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, then went to white cabinetry. So whites and grays were all the rage. Then I would say in the past five years, you've seen a lot of blues that have really come into the overall color scheme and people are doing a lot of white and blue kitchens and currently it's greens. So whether it's a sage green or a dark kind of billiard green, I mean, people are doing really cool green cabinets, especially in kind of offices and libraries and um, even mud rooms. You'll see those painted cabinetry, you know, cool kind of funky colors in those spaces. Mm -hmm. um, as far as wood species, um, you know, your main wood species are always going to be cherry, oak, maple, hickory. Walnut is now becoming a very popular wood species. So we're looking at Anne's vanity right now. That was a beautiful cherry with a, uh, it was a stain called pheasant. Um, and then now, so walnut, you're going to find, now cherry's going to have, you can see, is going to have some of that distinct grain running through it, some wormholes and knots. Uh, walnut is going to have very dark and then almost kind of blonde streaks running through it. I love those um, blonde flames in walnut. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, you know, the kitchen in general is kind of trending towards becoming the focal point of the home. People love hanging around an island. Of course, the person in the kitchen doesn't want to be left out, you know, alone. So while they're cooking or cleaning, they want to interact with their guests and other people that are in the house at the time. So bringing the kitchen kind of into living spaces is becoming more and more popular. I mean, I can't tell you how many times we've taken a dining room or a living room or an office off of the kitchen and combined it into one space just to make it more open. Um, and then what do we have? Creative storage solutions. So 
Everything from cabinet companies are getting very creative with their different storage accessories. So everything from spice pullouts to utensil organizers, tray dividers, um, you have cordless vacuum here. So like a Dyson plug-in and a utility cabinet um, that's, you know, in charging drawers. So everybody has a junk drawer in the kitchen. You have a little outlet in the drawer where you can charge cell phones and other electronics. Well, um, I'll say real quick, you helped me on the, on the cabinet you see in the photo. There's a, yeah. a an outlet for a hairdryer. So the hairdryer just goes back in the cabinet and it's permanently plugged in. And yeah. right here behind me in the top drawer here is a charging station in the drawer. You know, so it's really nice because when I, when I run low on this thing, which happens a lot, I can just turn around and plug it in. Yeah. But it's out I mean, of the any, way. Any, yeah, exactly. It's out of the way. Anything that reduces clutter or gives you more countertop space, they're finding a solution to put it in a cabinet now. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we have any knife blocks. You know, they have very cool accessories for knife blocks because, you know, you think about how much space a knife block takes on a counter. We're putting that in pullout cabinets now where you open it, you kind of pull it out you have all your knives in there um and then so storage solutions colors and then outdoor kitchens um especially over the pandemic people are loving to spend more time outdoors so whether it, you know we've we haven't personally done many outdoor kitchens but you're gonna see you know kitchens with pizza ovens and grills and outdoor refrigerators and uh, ice makers you know the outdoor kitchen is becoming even more you know four seasons rooms even are becoming that living space just off of the home one of our guests who's done asked the expert a couple of times pragya mishra is a landscape architect and oh, she's yeah. working I met her. yeah she's working with one of our general contractor friends and they're doing a a pool, pool house, and outdoor kitchen. I mean, it's an incredible yeah. spread. Wow. Um, oh, well, so here are some pictures. You want to tell us a little bit about these? Well, there's that beautiful yes. big, I call it central command, the kitchen, because you're doing homework, you're entertaining, you have your, your office sometimes. So anyway, go mm -hmm. ahead. I'm sorry. Well, let's, so top left is a great example of that blue, you know, blues and white that I was mentioning. So that navy blue, um, you know, this, they actually, this is a two-tone kitchen. So they had a blue island, white perimeter cabinetry. And you can even see when I was saying anything that can get something off the countertop and into a cabinet, see the microwave that's in the island. Mm -hmm. No one's doing a countertop microwave anymore. You want to either have that in a wall hung um, you know, cabinet space for your microwave or in a base cabinet like you see in this island. Mm -hmm. Then bottom, so the, I would put the top left, we can kind of talk about different cabinet styles here too. Top left is very transitional. So you're not quite in, you know, the traditional farmhouse kitchen there, but it's a very traditional transitional kitchen with like shaker doors, simple clean lines not super decorative crown molding, things like that. And then you go to the picture below it of that office and library space, that is traditional. So you have very dark cherry cabinetry with intricate detail, kind of millwork and crown molding. Um, you know, all of the, you, know, you really just get that richness out of a wood toned mm -hmm. cabinet instead of, you know, a painted finish. Sort of old so, world feeling. Mm -hmm. So more traditional in that um, library uh, picture on the bottom left there. And then in the middle, so we, you know, we do other spaces like you mentioned, and um, laundry rooms, offices, bars, bathrooms, and kitchens. So you could see um, the laundry room here. They did a slab door. So that's a slab those. cabinet door. Very flat, uh, flat and very simple. Um, almost no crown molding there, but it's just, you know, and especially in a laundry room where you're going to have clothes everywhere and cleaning supplies, it just simplifies the space and beautifies it a little more. Um, so I would say that middle there, we're still, you know, you're stepping into modern with the slab doors and drawer fronts, but mm -hmm. still kind of in the transitional with the wood tones. Mm -hmm. um, the top right kitchen there, this was a DC loft kitchen we did. And, you know, this is kind of combining modern and transitional because you have that dark, rich, I think that's cherry again right there in like an espresso tone. 
mm-hmm. um, in the in the wood, and then you have slab doors and drawer fronts. So you're 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 combining the two, which I mean, mm-hmm. it looks great. And yeah. you know, again, when you're remodeling, keep your location and the type of home in mind. Mm-hmm. Um, you probably, you know, the kitchen in the top right here with that dark uh, espresso and cherry wood, you probably would not do in, you know, like a French country home. It's right. too modern looking. Uh, this is definitely a DC apartment kind of high rise, more modern look. The kitchen in the top left, you know, is a little more transitional. Uh, you probably would not do that in like a DC high rise apartment. So keep in mind the style of home and, of course, your personal style when what looking about, at cabinetry. What about, um, you know, I always tell people consider the light, too. Like, if you back to the woods and that's where your kitchen is. Yes. If you're sensitive to light, you may not want to, even if you love walnut, you may not want to pick a dark walnut, you know, or something like that. Because Be sensitive know. to light and certain woods, too, will age depending on, you know, the amount of light that hits them. Like, Mm -hmm. for instance, cherry will kind of darken over time as light hits it. You know, some people think the opposite. It lightens, you know, the more light it gets. Um, But yes, you know, if you have a darker kitchen, you probably wouldn't want black cabinets in there. Um, Think of something like a lighter gray or a white. Mm -hmm. What about, um, what about, how do you tell the quality of cabinetry, Alex? Because I see a lot of homes and some I'm like, ugh, they just did this to flip it. And it's like, it, it looks pretty, you know, the, the saying lipstick on a pig, like it mm-hmm. looks pretty, but then you look a little closer and you're like, wow, this is very builder grade. Yeah. You know, finishing and refacing is becoming a big trend here recently too, because cabinetry is fairly expensive. I mean, most cabinets are made in the U S and, um, they're, most of them are semi-custom, meaning they're made for you when you order them. So um, when you're looking at quality, I mean, first of all, I want to touch, there's, there's three main construction types of cabinets. Mm-hmm. The first one being uh, full access, which means there's no frame around the cabinet. This is usually going to be your um, European cabinet lines. Mm-hmm. Then you have inset cabinetry where the cabinet door is set into the frame of the cabinet. Mm -hmm. And then we have full overlay where the door sits on top of the frame of the cabinet and Mm -hmm. partial overlay where you see the face frame around it and the doors get smaller. Um, Inset is the most desirable look for cabinets. So if you're looking at inset cabinets, you know right off the bat, that's pretty quality. Full overlay and partial overlay are the most common. I would say partial overlay is the cheapest, well, most cost-effective type of construction simply because you see more frame around it, the doors are smaller, it's not going to be as expensive. And then full overlay is definitely the most common type of cabinet construction that you're going to see in terms of door styles. In terms of quality, everyone's going to want the soft close hinges and drawer glides. So when you open that cabinet door and slam it shut, it does not slam. You're going to have that that mechanism in the hinge, which is going to allow that door to slowly close, which is awesome, especially if you have kids or a large family where these cabinets are getting used a lot. And um, for the drawers, you're going to have that soft close mechanism as well, so you can't slam them shut. And then for construction quality, if you can somehow get this information, you want cabinets that are going to have all plywood construction. So that means the box of the cabinet, which is going to be the sides and the back, are going to be plywood instead of like a cheaper particle board or furniture board. So that is a major indicator to the quality of your cabinetry. The face frame should always be a hardwood. So like the front of the cabinet should be the same species as like your door. So if you get a cherry, um, if you decide on like a cherry stain for a door that you're getting on your cabinets, you wanna make sure that frame is also gonna be cherry. So the frame is hardwood, the cabinet boxes should be plywood. um, And then as far as the door style, you're looking at uh, full access, inset, partial overlay and full overlay. You know, I sometimes see cabinets and I'm always happy when I see wood cabinets where the end panels 
are nicely finished and appointed. Yes. You know, maybe they have the raised panel, but they're wood. But sometimes, and I point out to my clients, we'll look at the door panels and then I go around to the side of the cabinet and I tap it and I say, I want you to come look at this. And it's like plastic. Yeah. It's like yeah. a plastic. Uh, like a laminate or, or a vinyl kind of yeah, coating on the cabinet. Yeah, match, made match, but it doesn't, it's as close as I guess the manufacturer could get it. But I'm always like, ugh. Like, yeah. this is not a good look, you know? Yeah, you know exactly what to look for, Anne. Nice. Well, I mean, those I, are, especially as a realtor, those are key things. And if the client, will, you know, kitchen is a priority for them. Yeah, I mean, because yeah. you could slap a white coat of paint on an oil, you know, a 20-year-old cabinet, and it can look totally fine and functional. But, yeah. you know, until you really get in there and start living in it, you don't really realize some of the issues that might arise. I've seen uh, contractors pull the thermofoil finish off the white. Yeah. Paint the part underneath. Uh, yes. You know what I'm talking about? And maybe mm -hmm. if they use a decent paint, that's a good solution. Because that, that thermofoil stuff just peels off over time, you know? Yes. Yep. Yep. I know you know, because I'm talking to a... Uh, yeah, yeah, we don't guy. sell much thermofoil anymore, fortunately. Right. Yes. Laundry um, rooms, maybe. I mean, you know, it has, it has had its place. I don't, you know. Um, yeah. So, you know, we, we've talked some about um, cabinets. And let's talk a little bit about counters. So um, different types of um, countertops, materials that are in right now, or, or they don't have to be in. I mean, just different materials that you see. If you uh, share some of these, we've got some great photos. Yeah. So, I mean... I want to I want to add something too. I mean, as a kitchen designer, or um, any any kitchen designer that you're planning on working with, they should have a basic knowledge of countertops, because you know those are with appliances in mind too. Those are two of the three main materials that your kitchen designer should have uh, pretty adequate knowledge about. So. When you're asking them about countertops, they're probably going to tell you about the main types of countertops. And the most popular in our area are definitely going to be granite, quartz, exotic stones, but there's a long, long list of those, wood or butcher block counters, recycled glass, laminate and decton. So um, granite is a natural stone. You're, you know, they, they quarry big stones of granite out of the earth, cut them up into slabs, polish them off and then install it on your counter. So the top the um, top left picture there is a great example of a uh, granite countertop. That's actually called Luna Pearl, it looks like. Um, granite is the, probably gonna be your most affordable, well, other than laminate, probably going to be your most affordable option. I would say right now, most granite counters are running between 60 and $80 per square foot. Then you have quartz, which is a man-made material, and quartz has pretty much completely taken over the market for countertops. Um, in the last, I would say, quartz has been around for probably about 20 years now, um, and quartz is a man-made material. So they take the actual stone quartz, they grind it up, and they bind it with different colors and resins and diff other binders to make these really cool patterns. Um, so what you see in that bottom middle picture, just a flat white counter, that's a quartz counter. You cannot achieve that look with a natural stone with, you know, just a flat white look. That's a quartz counter, which is a man-made material. Quartz is probably, it's going to be the most durable countertop material because it is man-made. You could set hot pots on it. It won't burn or leave a stain. You could spill red wine, tomato sauce, mustard. It will not stain. Um, so it's very durable and requires almost no maintenance. For the exotic stones, you're going to be, you know, looking, you know, what falls under the category of exotics would be like quartzites, marbles, soapstones, um, you know, a lot of times the exotics are going to be at a higher price point, depending on what you find. Um, but, and they sometimes require a little more maintenance. So you want to make sure that your fabricator seals them correctly, or maybe some fabricators or suppliers will even put a warranty on the stone. Um, and, but that you you, keep, and that you keep up with it, right? With sealing exactly. it. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Most fabricators will put like a 10 to 15 year seal on their stones these days. I mean, I know 
like they used to tell you you had to seal your granite every two years. That's not necessarily the case anymore, but just keep an eye on it. If you ever noticed a little fissure starting to come or a little crack or dent, get that checked out as soon as possible so it doesn't lead to a bigger crack or a bigger problem in your counter. But the thing you get with exotic stones is these just beautiful looking patterns and designs that you can't achieve with a quartz or a granite. You know, a lot of the exotic stones are coming from Brazil and Russia and India and uh, parts of Europe. So, um, you know, they have a very distinct look. And if that's something you want in your kitchen, then something like a quartzite, a marble or a soapstone would be up your alley. Nice. Um, wood and butcher's block tops. I mean, uh, like I mentioned yesterday, you know, if you if this is going to be a heavy traffic or heavy use space, um, you know, think twice about doing a butcher's block. They are beautiful, but they are, you know, it's an organic material like wood. So it can be prone to denting or chipping or scratching. Um, but like you see there, that bottom bottom left picture looks like a very, almost maybe even walnut. Um, but you could achieve uh, you know, almost kind of a rustic. I've seen people do butcher's block in a rustic uh, design and a modern design. So you can take butcher's block in both directions. Um, recycled glass is another type of, you know, this is a man-made um, countertop as well. So they'll actually take quartz and instead of using a different binder or color or resins to make the pattern, they'll use recycled glass to make the pattern and they could achieve really cool uh, designs and looks there with recycled glass. And it's more environmentally friendly. Um, laminate it's counters. Not, it's not uh, fragile the way glass is, is it? Like it has no, no proper, okay. Right, so the actual, you know, they, they take glass and they kind of pulverize it or depending on the, the look of the counter, um, chip it so it has little specks and chips of the recycled glass running throughout but it is not you know it's not um glass itself it's recycled glass that's used in a quartz counter okay to achieve that look and then laminate is going to be um at your best price point i'm sure everyone has uh you know, set a hot pot on a laminate counter before and, you know, you get the bubbling up and the burn marks in the counter. But that's right. going to, I mean, laminate counter, you're even in the 10 to $20 per square foot range. Alex, um, that's when you need your microwave back on your counter so you can put it over the burn. Yeah, mark. yeah, yeah. So laminate, I mean, you're doing in a laundry room or maybe a kitchen if you're just flipping it and you want it to look nice. Um, but laminate counters are quick and easy to fabricate, and they're a very cost-effective solution for counters. Mm -hmm. And then Decton is the last one we put on there. This is actually a new, this is a brand of quartz, which is made by a company called Cosentino, which is specific for outdoor use. So Decton is the first of its kind that is specifically used for outdoor spaces, and it does not weather and uh, meaning it doesn't dull or lose its polish. And it's going to, um, even when the sun hits it, because obviously most, you know, outdoor spaces have direct sunlight, it is almost like heat resistant. So you could even have like a black Decton countertop sitting in the sun and you could put your hands and arms on it. It will not burn you. Wow. It's, uh, yeah, so that's kind of a cool feature of Decton countertops. Um, and that's made by Cosentino, like I mentioned, Italian company. I know we're, so, we're running. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. That was it. I was just going to say, I know we're running a little tight on time, but do you ever see okay. con concrete um, countertops? Yes, concrete counters are becoming more and more popular, too. Oh, really? I, I don't have a fabricator for count, you know, concrete counters. But, you know, if you want that almost industrial look or even modern look, the concrete counters can almost achieve a look of like soapstone. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're not as, you know, they have almost that matte finish, so they're not super shiny. Concrete counters are very popular these days. Yeah, you'll see them all over Pinterest and House. And, yeah. I was, I was going to say they'd go probably with that DC loft look, right? Yes. Yep. Um. Alex, I know that we went long. We started a little late. We went long. It's such a good topic. I could ask a bunch more questions if we had more time. But sure. I want to share your information here, which Jennifer has put up. Um, mm -hmm. You're available for free initial consultations, which is awesome. 
You can yes. do all the kinds of things we talked about, you know, kitchens, garages, libraries, laundry rooms, mud rooms, all of that. Um, and this is your contact information. Um, I used you to help me with my house and I love the stuff that you did for me. So thank you. I'm also Thanks, really Sam. grateful to you for being here today and sharing your knowledge with, you know, with us and with anybody who's watching or will watch in the future. And if anybody has questions, Alex is very approachable. I encourage you to reach out or you can certainly reach out to me or Jennifer and we'll get your questions to him and get them answered. Um, Definitely. I, I, I thank you for coming today, Alex. It's a really good educational um, Ask the Expert. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. You tested my expertise on Ask the Expert. I hope I uh, <laughs> hope this was informational for other people watching and for you. But yeah, like you said, we do free initial consultations or if anybody even just has a question on, even if they don't need cabinetry and they're thinking of a different remodel project, you know, do you know contractors or where should I start if I'm doing this? I'd be happy to help. Perfect. That's awesome. Well, I want to thank you again. I want to encourage people to reach out to Alex. If you have any questions, you have any upcoming projects, you want a consultation. Um, I think he's great. And you saw his information. Please do share this Ask the Expert with your friends and family, people you know of who are thinking of taking on a project. If you need an expert in real estate, I'm always happy to help. Um, even if you need somebody in a different part of the country, I'm regularly powwowing with great realtors all around, even in Canada and um, Italy, I've had a referral to, so let me know if you need any help. Um, and we will be back in another couple of weeks with Ask the Expert. And um, thank you for joining us today.